Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session with Mr. Jeffrey Brock and Miss Padma Viswanathan. It is so good to see everyone this morning. Um, welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival. I'm Lydia, and I'll be talking to Padma and Jeffrey about their wonderful work. Um, Miss Padma is the author of The Toss of a Lemon, The Ever After of Ashwin Rao, and her newest translation is Sao Bernardo by Graciliano Ramos. Um, so that is a translation from Portuguese. And then Mr. Brock writes a lot of good poetry, translates poetry, um, and I have been focusing on his latest translation from French, this beautiful illustrated book um, called The Tenderness of Stones. So welcome, guys. And Padma, would you mind introducing yourself first? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is a pretty good introduction to my uh, work in general. So I was just going to introduce the, um, this book that I'll be reading from today, San Bernardo by Graciliano Ramos. Um, Graciliano, uh, which is in, in uh, Brazilians typically refer to authors by their first names instead of their last, so I'll refer to him as, as Graciliano. Um, he's one of Brazil's most famous and cherished novelists. Um, this novel is from 1934. Uh, he had four works of fiction. This is the second to last, his third novel, and then finally, um, he wrote a book called Vida Secas, which is a, a novel in stories, essentially. Um, and so th this, this book was, as, as I said, it came third in his canon. After that, he mostly wrote nonfiction. He did a stint in jail, courtesy of the dictator, uh, shortly, uh, right around the time, actually, that this was coming out and wrote a massive memoir of that, along with children's books. and. Um, a memoir of his childhood and uh, a number of short pieces. So quite prolific in his lifetime, which was um, 1880 something to 1950 something, <laughs> I'm gonna say. So you can see the period that he spans. And very notably about him, and this is very significant for this book, he lived in Alagoas in the Northeast of Brazil, far away from the centers, the urban centers in the South, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. These are, are places that culturally and geographically were very distant from him, even though he spent a short time in Rio as a young man trying to make it as a journalist. He relatively shortly, for several reasons we can talk about, ended up going back to his home area and was really one of the first uh, fully literary writers to bring this area's concerns, its geography, its humor, its language, um, its you know, idioms, which we'll talk about later, into national visibility to sort of valorize this area as a site for you know, literary production. Um, other sort of interesting things about him, he was a shopkeeper and a mayor, one uh, funny story about how he actually became a writer is that he, he became mayor of his small town, which was a place of uh, sort of thug rule in, in a way. It was being ruled by these brutal landowning families and he was sort of forced to take this position because his predecessor was actually shot and killed and uh, as, you know, as other people were at, the, at that time. So he took this reluctantly, this position and became mayor and had certain agendas, including um, public hygiene, including building good roads. And he wrote these um, annual reports that he had to send to the state. The, these somehow got into uh, the press. They got published in newspapers because they were hilarious. They were super literary. I mean, they talk about, okay, I spent this much money on this and this much money on that. But as you read them, you can see this portrait of small town life in Brazil at that time. There are little jokes and snipes at those ruling, uh, you know, ruling families, at other people who were his critics. And uh, this guy, guy in, uh, in Rio at the time, uh, a guy called Schmidt, a, a poet and also somebody working in government, saw these when they made it into the, the newspapers. I mean, they went like viral, really. They, everybody in Brazil read them briefly, going like, who is this small town mayor in Alagoas publishing this thing? Because they're also very um, daring, sort of insouciant and snarky. 
And so he contacted uh, Graciliano Hamas and said, are you a writer by any chance? Like, are you writing something else? And Graciliano says, yes, I happen to have this novel here sitting in my drawer. And so it was taken and published, and that was really how he was launched onto the national stage. So I think this gives you a sense of how he was positioned relative to you know, the powers uh, that be in Brazil at that time, but also what he was taking as his material. And you really see it in San Bernardo, which is the, a novel about uh, a man called Paulo Nario, who is born uh, to people he doesn't, he never knows. There's a record vaguely of his birth in the um, parish, uh, the parish records, uh, but he never knows his parents. He's raised mostly by this um, impoverished candy maker and he's illiterate. He's working as a day laborer on a farm, a farm called San Bernardo, when he gets into a fight over a girl and he gets thrown in jail. And he spends his time in jail learning to read and write. And when he emerges, he has a new ambition. His ambition is to own the farm where once he worked as a day laborer. And so he begins ruthlessly to pursue that goal, which he accomplishes. He manages through all kinds of uh, trickery, not exactly illegal, but a bunch of um, sort of slightly dubious means, including possibly some, uh, you know, killing, possibly some, you know, dubious debts, possibly a little blackmail to grab hold of this farm, which he then restores from uh, its derelict condition because it's fallen into the hands of this heir who just, you know, uses it basically as a, a weekend getaway and isn't trying to produce anything with it. He manages to make it into this extremely fertile, productive farm. He becomes, uh, you know, sort of a big man in his own right in the region, and he marries. He marries a woman not exactly of his station. He marries a school teacher, a woman who is educated, who in a sense speaks a different language from him. And he can't own her in the way that he owns his farm. He can't run her the way he runs his farm. And in this, he starts to fall apart in this, in this mix. He's a man in an impossible position, I have said. Somebody who in a sense um, has, he's risen out of the class that he belongs to, but he knows he'll never belong to the class to which he sort of aspires. And he despises both in a sense. And this is his memoir. After things go badly with his marriage, he sits down to write his memoir. So I'm just gonna read um, a tiny bit of the Portuguese, just the, the first paragraph and then the first chapter of, of the book, which I think gives you a pretty good sense of its tone and, and content. So in the Portuguese first. Antes de iniciar este livro, imaginei construir aquela divisão do trabalho. Dirigi-me a alguns amigos e quase todos consentiram de boa vontade em contribuir para o desenvolvimento das letras nacionais. Padre Silvestre ficaria com a parte moral e as citações latinas. João Nogueira aceitou a pontuação, a ortografia e a sintaxe prometia ao Arquimedes a composição tipográfica para a composição literária, convidei Lúcio Gomes de Azevedo Gondim, redator e diretor do Cruzeiro. Eu traçaria o plano, introduziria na história rudimentos de agricultura e pecuária, faria as despesas e poria o meu nome na capa. Now in English. Before I started this book, I thought division of labor was the way to go. I approached several friends, and most of them heartily agreed to pitch in for the betterment of our national literature. Padre Silvestri would look after the moral side and the Latin quotations. João Nogueira took on punctuation, spelling, and syntax. I promised Archimedes the typography, while for literary flair, I invited Lucio Gomez de Azevedo Gondim editor and director of the Cruzeiro. I'd outline the plan, insert the, insert the basics of agriculture and cattle raising, cover the costs, and put my name on the cover. It was an exciting week, meeting with my main collaborators. I could already see the volumes on display, 1,000 sold, thanks to the eulogies I'd placed in the wafer-thin Gazeta on Costa Brito's recent death, trying to gain some advantage. Anyway, my optimism went up in smoke when I realized we weren't all seeing eye to eye. 
João Nogueira wanted a novel in the language of Camões, which with sentences turned back to front. Count me out. Padre Silvestri gave me a chilly reception. After the October Revolution, he turned fanatical, demanding rigorous investigations and punishments for anyone who wouldn't wear a red scarf. He gave me the side eye, and we were friends. Those patriots. It's fine. Everybody has their obsessions. I dropped him from the plan and set my hopes on Lucio Gomez Giazavedo Gonji, a good-natured journalist who writes what he's told to. We worked for a few days. Afternoons, Azevedo Gonji would leave the newspaper to Archimedes, lock the nickel and dime drawer, and pedal his bicycle out to San Bernardo, half an hour on the roadway that Casimiro Lopez had been trying to fix with a couple of other guys. He'd comment on the day's headlines, denounce the government, drink the glass of brandy Maria de Torres brought him, and, feeling important, meekly command, let's get to it. We'd go to the porch, sink into wicker chairs, and work out the plot, smoking, looking out on the Karaku heifers grazing in the pasture below, and farther out at the edge of the woods, the red roof of the sawmill. At the start, everything went well. We were in perfect agreement, had long conversations, but each of us turned out to be listening to himself, not taking seriously what the other said. Warming to my subject, I forgot what Gonjin was actually like. I saw him as some kind of blank page, receiving the confused ideas boiling up in my brain. The result was a disaster. Two weeks or so after our first meeting, the Cruzeiro's editor presented me with two typed chapters of nonsense. I lost my temper. Go to hell, Gonjin. You've made a mess of the whole thing. It's pompous. It's fake. It's idiotic. No one talks this way. Azevedo Gonjin switched off his smile, swallowed the insult, and swept together the shards of his meager vanity. Sulking, he objected that an artist can't write the way he talks. He can't? I asked, astonished. Why not? He can't because he can't, Azevedo Gonjin replied. It's like this because it's always been that way. Literature is literature, São Paulo. Folks argue or fight, go about their business in a natural sort of way, but arranging words colorfully is something else. If I wrote the way I talk, no one would read me. I got up and leaned on the balustrade to get a closer look at the limousine bull Marciano was leading into the cowshed. A cicada started buzzing. Old Macarita was coming along the wall of the dam, bent double. In the church tower, an owl hooted. I shuddered, thinking of Madalena, and filled my pipe. It's the devil's own job, Gonji. It's all gone to pot. Three failed attempts in a month. Drink your brandy, Gonji. That's the end of the first chapter. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, one thing that stuck out to me, I've read it. I'm, I um, have been reading it the past couple of weeks. Um, and it's funny to hear your teacher nice, soft voice, because when I'm reading this in my head, I'm hearing this gruff, grouchy man kind of, you know, telling his story. And so it's like, I'm hearing your voice. And I'm like, that doesn't quite line up because he is, it's such a voice, the whole story of this just gruff, confused, just upset old man. And it's really, um, it makes me laugh. It makes me chuckle. And um, I love the quote, it's like this because it's always been this way. And that just resonates, that hit. Okay, Jeff, you want to share with us? You're muted. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was trying to drown out the barking dog there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about this um, graphic novel, I guess we, we'll call it, called The Tenderness of Stones by Marion Fayol, who's a young French author. She's about 31 or so. She was born in 1988, I think. And um, she's published six or seven books, um, graphic books, comics, graphic novels, whatever your preferred term is for this, for this genre. This particular book, The Tenderness of Stones, that I translated for the New York, for New York Review Comics, uh, is a kind of um, graphic memoir of about her father and about her caring for her father as he, as he, uh, you know, uh, struggles against cancer and eventually dies. And it, it sounds it sounds very bleak when I describe it that way. 
Um, and it is in certain ways bleak and certainly um, not, not, a, not a, a sort of happy book, but it's told, there's, there's several things I love about it, the, the way it's told, it's not told sentimentally at all. Um, also, it's told in this sort of surreal visual style that sort of highlights the sort of absurdities and ironies and occasional comedy of uh, this process that they go through. And uh, one of the reasons it's not sentimental is because she actually had this very kind of a very difficult relationship with her father, judging from this book. And um, he, he was a difficult guy. He wasn't, he, he wasn't, the, you know, like this ideal father figure. And so um, she has lots of mixed feelings as she drops, she's this young, you know, writer with this successful burgeoning career and she drops everything to go home and take care of him. And so there's a lot of, a lot of complicated emotions and she, she draws them and writes about them quite, quite beautifully, I think. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm just going to read one little section that I think gives you a sense of some of the kinds of things that she does, both in terms of uh, the words and the pictures and the way they come together. Um, she, one of the things that she does is she focuses on individual body parts a lot, like the parts of his body that are, um, that are in some way affected by the cancer. His lung is removed at the, at the very beginning and they, they sort of have a funeral for his lung. Um, and it, you, you, she draws it in this kind of surreal, super large way and um, such that it takes like many people to carry it. Um, and so right away, you're, you're, you know that this is not sort of a conventional memoir about cancer. Um, it was interesting for, for me too, and I can talk about this later if anybody wants, but I, I actually translated this uh, shortly after my own father had died of cancer. And so that was a very strange translation experience. But um, I'm gonna focus on, on this one passage on page 60, it starts on page 65, where she kind of sums up what happens um, as he becomes more and more dependent on her and the rest of her family members um, needing them. He, he loses the ability to speak, um, to do things. He loses his manual dexterity and he has trouble with his hands. And so he needs lots of help. And she sort of portrays all this as, as him borrowing parts of other people's bodies. Um, I'll just read a section. After his transformation, dad constantly needed us and was borrowing pieces of our bodies. When his friends came to visit, I was of course expected to let him use my mouth so they could converse. Having just one mouth for two people gets pretty annoying. The timing was often bad. I needed it too. I was even using it at that very moment. I was on the phone. I had to drop everything to give him my mouth. It was his turn to use it. I found it a little bit unfair, but I didn't want to seem selfish. So I generously offered him my lips, putting my own activities on hold. And this is visualized in the book graphically as if literally the lips were transferring from one face to another. Um, often he borrowed our hands. He needed them for turning on the TV, for putting on his pants and for many other daily activities. He would see the cat passing by but he wasn't quick enough to catch it. Can somebody give dad the cat? He can't pet the cat all by himself. I'm in the middle of riding. Um, little by little, we all became extensions of his body. Everything he could no longer do, we did in his place. We took over for him, completed him, became his arms, his legs, his voice, whatever he lacked, we loaned him. Until at some point, it became hard to tell our arms from his, hard to know, if my voice was still my own or was now also his. So that gives you a little sense of, of the way she approaches the physicality of this illness and, and her relationship to him. Um, it's a very, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a graphic novel. I call it a graphic novel. Graphic novel is a very flexible term. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a work of fiction the way that we expect the word novel to work in, in a, you know, by itself. Graphic novels are often um, memoirs or um, they can be historical or 
rep uh, reportage. They can be various kinds of uh, almost any genre. It just it just suggests a book length work told in in comics. Um, so that's it, it's a and it's a you know because it's a, an integrated work of words and pictures. It's, it can be tricky to to read from in this context. So I think I'm just going to read that short excerpt and sort of open it to questions or comments. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I have truly enjoyed having this in my hands. This is just for any family or individual who's going through some sort of grief, to have this on your table, uh, to hold it, to open it, and see the honesty about the grief process, this is truly powerful. Um, I would also like to say uh, Marion, Marion Foyer, she um, illustrates for the New York Times. So if you Google my people who are listening, Marion Foyer and New York Times, you'll see the kind of illustrations she does. Um, but I just totally recommend having this on hand. Um, I have not lost anyone recently, but I still found it so touching and powerful. Um, the voice of the daughter who's writing it is just so, or is the daughter representing Mar Marion? Yes, it's a memoir. It's, it's her, okay, it's her. Okay. Pardon me. Yeah, so it, that's why it's so honest and um, so clear. And I think it captures this element of grief where you feel almost resentment, not necessarily towards your loved one, but towards everything because of this is happening. So it's like, God, I have to loan in my mouth. I have to loan in my hands. You know, and I think that those of us who've been through a grief process know what that's like. Um, so I just feel like that's so well captured. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to ask you guys um, a question. Why are these two particularly, and if you want to talk about any of your other work, please do. Um, I'm a language teacher, so the translation element is super fascinating to me. I speak Spanish fluently, and I'm working on French. Um, and why are these books important? Why, why um, do you, what do you think these books have to offer to people? Why is it important that it moves from Portuguese to English? You know what I mean? Why is it important that it went from French to English? What does this have to give people? Um, what, how is it gonna help them see their situation or their society in a different light? Like what is this literature gonna do for them? And what did you guys see that motivated you through the translation process? Jeff, you want to take this? Whoever wants to start. Um, well, um, you know, if a book is worth, you know, in general, I would say if a book is worth reading um, in one language, uh, then it's probably worth reading in other languages. And um, and so, if it and 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 the you know to to for somebody to choose a book to translate is a, is a kind of endorsement and a kind of uh, reflection of value already that somebody, this book means enough to somebody to want to translate it. Um, and, or, you know, a, a company like New York Review Comics, um, which is uh, this wonderful, you know, independent publisher. Um, and, and they see something in this book in French that they admire and that they think is is doing something interesting with the, the medium of comics and um, they want to make that part of their their list in English. They're trying to build a, they're building a, an amazing list of comics in English and they think that this offers something that, that she's doing something, um, you know, it's, uh, her, her graphic style is so, um, uh, so, so much her own and, and this particular approach to the memoir, I think, is is a very fresh approach, and the um, the cancer memoir, particularly, it's um, and and it's a very and it's also unusual. It's unusually literary as a comic too, because there's not a lot of very few speech bubbles. You know, it's mostly told, it's mostly narrated um, in this kind of almost literary voice, um, and, and so it's it's just an interesting hybrid, and and I just loved it when they when it came across when it, my desk and it, and it, you know as i mentioned earlier in my particular case i had recently lost my father to cancer and so obviously the book affected me and it hit me in a very particular way and what became translating it from in you know and this is unusual 
you know, for all the other books that I've translated, I don't have this kind of particular personal relationship to it, but translating it became a part of my grief process in a way. Um, and so that's not going to necessarily be the case for most people who <laughs> read the book. Um, but for some it might. And, um, and it's, as far as other books, like, you know, I, ha I have an, another new book that just came out this week, actually, uh, a collection of poetry. I've, I've translated more poetry than, than comics, more poetry and fiction. And this is a book called Allegria by Giuseppe Ungaretti, who's a, a modernist Italian poet. Um, and this is his first collection from, um, of poems written in World War I. And they're just uh, extraordinarily beautiful and influential poems in the Italian tradition. And uh, I, I've loved them for a long time. They've, some, many of them have been translated before, but the whole collection had not been translated before. And that was a case where I felt it was such an important monumental book in one tradition that uh, I, 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 wanted, I wanted it to be available to readers in English, um, to, you know, who have an interest in, in modernism in general, um, World, World War I literature, uh, Italian poetry. There's so many um, different reasons to read that collection. So I'll, I'll just stop there. there there's, there's lots of, you know, what I hope to indicate by that is there's lots of different reasons one translates a given book, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, where to start with, with this? I mean, in, in my case, I'm a, you know, much more sort of junior translator. And um, so I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to understand what, say, an Anglophone audience might look for and what a publisher might look for. But my, my, the, the book that I've translated is, of course, a, a classic of Brazilian literature and Graciano Ramos, I mean, that final book that I mentioned, Vidas Secas, which could be translated literally as Dry Lives. Um, it's on school curricula. I mean, he's, Graciano Ramos is, is really one of the most lauded Brazilian writers on his anniversaries, birth, death anniversaries. There are you know, beautiful box sets that are issued. And so when I realized that um, this novel, his second to last novel, it had had an English translation, but not for 40 years. It was the, this uh, English translation was out of print. It wasn't widely circulated. And the book is still, I mean, you know, if you enjoyed it, Lydia, I'm glad. I mean, I still think there's a lot of appeal there for contemporary, um, you know, North American readers. And so the fact that the previous translation would feel at this point um, dated, it was British. Um, I'm also partially answering, there seems to be a question here about how I distinguish this translation from a previous translation. So I can fold that a little bit into, uh, you know, into my answer. Uh, I encountered the book probably first in Portuguese. I can't remember anymore. And then tried to see if there was a translation of it. Yes, there was, but I, you know, I hadn't really heard of this novel the way I'd heard of, of the last one. And uh, I enjoyed it so much that I thought it was a shame not to be able to share it in a translation that I really felt I could get behind and talk about its its qualities, that it's funny. It um, has a lot of contemporary content that concerns anybody, uh, you know, talking about rising through class, of, about trying to struggle. I mean, I think a lot of contemporary America talks about this, what it is to come from a class background and to, to aspire essentially to another. And what that means about the fact that when you aspire to a different class, you're also in a sense aspiring to a different culture. There's a sort of uh, uh, self-rejection that has to come along with that aspiration. You know, I suppose I also understand this as the child of immigrants that much immigration happens because people are trying to make a better life for their children. But that process of rising in the world economically engenders this um, alienation. We sort of take it for granted, but this is one of the best books that I've ever read that explores that psychologically without trying to create a protagonist who's super sympathetic. He's really not. I mean, he's sort of unlikable in a lot of ways, and Brazilians love to hate him. And I love to talk about to talk about uh, how they love to hate him and how I actually love him. I, I love Paulo Monario because he's very difficult to love. He doesn't make himself easy to love, and that super appealed to me. And uh, you know, and I admit that my last novel, I only sort of realized this in retrospect, but I had created a narrator like that, somebody who is also difficult 
to like. So on some fundamental level, I'm very interested in protagonists who are unlikable and yet make you sort of love them even if you don't like them in a sense because they tell their, you know, a story so compellingly because they make you laugh because they make you in some way unable to look away. And I think this book has all of those, um, has all of those qualities that would appeal to a contemporary reader. Um, but, but the previous translation no longer carried that across for, for a contemporary reader. 40 years on, and especially for me as a North American, uh, I just, I wasn't hearing the, the, you know, acerbic wit. I wasn't really feeling the punchiness of the prose any longer in that translation from 40 years ago. There are a few reasons for that. I've mentioned the datedness. Of course, I also felt like there were things that could be better rendered. I mean, anybody who wants to retranslate a book usually feels that like there are aspects that they could improve from the other, from the previous translation, but I'm sure people might also disagree with me in that. And I think um, that, and I think Jeff would agree, Jeff is my translation mentor. We also happen to share a marriage and a house and kids and so on. So we talk about these things a lot. and. I, I think we both agree that any book worth translating or any poem worth translating is worth translating more than once because every translation is a reading, a very active reading of the work in question. And so presumably there are other translations available to other people also of this novel so that translations then um, start a conversation about how to read a book right? It's the kind of thing most of us as readers, I mean, that's why we're all here, right? Because we love to talk about books and translation is another way of talking about a book that you might love. In this case, of course, it's a book that is very much loved in Brazil. And so that any North American who's interested in international literature, in sort of the, you know, the, the most immortal books around the, the world, many of us feel like those should be available to, to English readers, right? And so in that spirit, I of course wanted to, to translate this also just for anybody who wants to know well, what do Brazilians hold up as some of their best works, this is one of them. So, Absolutely. Um, I actually, when I was first starting to dig on you guys, I um, asked my friend who grew up in Brazil and moved to the United States in her adult life, I said, do you know who Brasiliano Ramos is? And she was like, of course. Like he was there in high school. That's what we read. And so I go, oh, like this is, this is big. This is a really, um, it's like the Charles Dickens or whatever of their culture, you know, like this is what they yeah. high school. Um, so two things I wanted to ask about what you just said, if you don't mind, would you mind telling us where your parents are from and where they immigrated to and how that influences your work? Um, I, mine are the immigrant parents, <laughs> I think. Um, but Jeff's parents are also from somewhere that you can talk but about. She's talking to you. She's talking to you. She's talking oh, only to me. Okay, sorry, sorry. It's hard to tell. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so my parents immigrated from South India to Western Canada. That's where I grew up. And we now live in Fayetteville, uh, Arkansas, and my parents live with us. So my parents have immigrated twice to Canada and then to the US. And so I'm an immigrant here as well. Oh, and you said, and how does that influence? Yeah, uh, just briefly. Yeah. Um, well, as I, I hadn't thought of it before, but the, what you just said about uh, Ramos is ma makes me think that y your your experience uh, as a kind of immigrant or the child of immigrants may, may have influenced your choice of that book in some way. It's, I think I've realized it in retrospect. I think it often happens to us as writers that we only realize afterward why we have chosen the subjects or the you know, the subject matters or, or whatever issues that, that we're working on. I mean, I became interested in, and I think Lydia has, Lydia has frozen for me. So. I am frozen. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's good to know you can still hear us and uh, technology. Pretend yeah. like it's a I'm here. My voice is here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's clearer to me in my own uh, my own original writing how my background has influenced me. Mostly, I write about India and Canada. Brazil came as an interest for me in my twenties and has sort of grown in very unexpected ways. And this is the most recent outcropping of that. But I was, you know, motivated because of an interest in Brazil and particularly in Brazilian music 
and Brazilian um, religious history uh, and syncretic traditions to, to learn more about Brazil. And so I learned Portuguese as a result of that. And because I'm a writer and reader, learned more about Brazilian literature. But all of that sort of developed in a way independent of any literal sort of connection to my, you know, my own background. But now I sort of say that Canada, India, and Brazil are my great topics. I mean, that like that's all I can even try to learn about for basically the rest of my life. I feel like I'm still just at the beginning of learning about each of those massive countries. There's something in me that apparently is attracted to big, big unmanageable countries. And now here I am in another one. Love that. That is a beautiful way to say that. Uh, while we're on the topic, Mr. Jeffrey, why, who, where did your parents immigrate from, if you don't mind me asking, and how that influences your work? Um, no, well, they, uh, my, my parents are both from the South. Uh, my, my mom is from East Texas. My dad was from South Georgia. So I grew up in the South. Uh, and uh, so I'm not sure. Oh, I, I, thought, I thought Padma said they were immigrants. I mean, from Texas to Arkansas, you could call that immigration. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know. My from, God, I misunderstood. <laughs> that's right. Uh, from one kind of South to another, uh, maybe. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so another question, what I found so compelling about both of you and your work is that you, so Padma has written novels, uh, original works, and then Jeff, you've written a lot of poetry originally, your own work, and then you also do translation. So as you're um, writing your own works, you're creating your own voice, of course, to express your ideas and your stories. And then when you translate, you kind of put your voice to the side and you share the voice of the original author. Could you guys talk about what that is like, putting aside your own voice and doing your best to channel that uh, original author's voice? Jeff, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, that's one of the things I enjoy most about translating is, is coming up with a voice because, I mean, you, you hear a certain voice in the, the original text, but you have to you know, that doesn't, that voice does not come into English if you just translate sort of word by word um, or phrase by phrase, you, you don't get voice, you get Google Translate or something like that. Um, and the voices and tone and things like that are something you really have to sort of um, nurture into being in English. You have to, you have to consciously create them. And so it becomes a, a sort of act a, or an exercise of, of literary style or you know um, to, to create a voice in English and, and, and you and so for each translation for each author you you the challenge is to create a voice in English that somehow seems to reflect or embody or, or um, represent the voice that you hear in that original text and of course each translator will hear that original voice slightly differently and will will create you know, therefore recreate it in English in a, in a different way, which is another reason that, um, you know, multiple translations are often, um, you know, to the benefit of the original work because they offer, uh, offer different, uh, like different performances of a musical score. They may bring out different qualities um, of that original. And uh, so, so yeah, so I, I love, and, and with poets in general, you know, so I've, I've had two books of poetry come out in the past year in translation. And they're such different poets. This um, Ungaretti is a modernist, and he writes in these short lines, um, uh, very spare, very sparse, no, no rhyme. Um, Pascoli was a generation earlier, uh, and more, more traditional poet, wrote in, in sort of traditional stanzaic structures with rhyme, and, and uh, it's really from a, a kind of just on the cusp of modernity era, versus you know this this generation that's broken open by world war 1 and and um, modernism and 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 so trying to create different voices for those two poets was was um, i mean it's something that happens sort of naturally and unconsciously in the process but it's but you have to sort of also go back and reflect on it and shape it and revise it and it, it's it's one of the things that that I love about translating and then you know that comes back to my own work, I think it, it, you know, it has to sh give me new tools in my own writing in some way that may be hard to define, or I may not even be aware of, of what it's doing to my own 
writing, but it may it's presumably affecting it in some way and, and giving me give, giving me some new way to approach my own work. I'm also seeing a question here in the sidebar. Um, maybe I'll just answer that real quick. Does the graphic does the graphic aspect make a translation easier? You have a, a visual guide or more difficult, you have to make sure your translation works with the images. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it, obviously you do have to make sure your translation works with the images. Uh, and so, so it, the, the images do serve as a guide um, to the text. Uh, I mean, one of the things I like about this text and, and most good graphic novels is that they're not the text and the pictures usually do slightly different work. Um, they're not just narrations of the pictures. So there's something, the pictures are telling part of the story, the text is telling another part of the story. And so they're often complementary. Um, and and that's, in, in, in the best graphic novels, I think that's almost always the case. And so, so you're, you're, you're trying to make the text a, a good companion for the images and, um, I don't know if it makes it easier or harder, but it's just part of what you're thinking about. And, and another part of what you're thinking about is, of course, the size of the actual physical size of like the speech bubble or the little box that the text has to go in. Your translation has to fit in the same box. So that's a something that's different from comics in comics than it is in poetry. Hey, um, before we move to you, Padma, I would like to read, um, from page 51 and 52 of The Tenderness of Stones, uh, because I love this part. I just kind of wanted to snuggle up in it. It was really nostalgic, and I felt that uh, Jeff had to be kind of a genius to get this, this feeling to us, and the pictures as well, the illustrations as well. But so uh, the daughter says, mom has always been one of these women, ideally suited to the role of mother, exactly. Uh, her body is big and wide. Against her, you feel warm and safe. It's comforting. Except sometimes she doesn't know her own strength and hugs us a bit too tightly till we can't breathe. But she doesn't mean to, so we never stay mad at her for long. Isn't that just beautiful? That voice kills me. Lovely. Okay, Padma, what would you like to add about voice? Because, well, hold on. Before you start to lead into that, something that I found funny. I mean, I am just cackling while I read Sal Bernardo. But he says, so context doesn't really matter. Just listen to the words, folks. Marciano, a worn out mulatto, laughed it up, stretching and goggling and showing his gappy gums. Like, <laughs> the voice there, that is funny. Gappy gums. And then another page, uh, 109. Um, it, this is the inner dialogue of Honorio, the main character. And he says, maybe it was nothing. But for a guy like me, walking around with a bee in my bonnet, aggravating. That is so funny. Just the way those words are matched together. So can you talk about the voice that you uh, gave to us, Padma, and how you kind of put away your own novel voice or incorporated that, I don't know, to, to give us this work in English. Yeah, I mean, you've hit on some, like, you know, several quite um, interesting and, and huge topics, right, in, in translation by choosing those, those bits, things over which I struggled. I mean, I've already said that uh, Paulo Nario is not likable and that he, in some ways, um, on the one hand, he's very entertaining. On the other hand, I think that there is, in the reader, there's a sort of a doubleness of response, right? Both the, um, certainly the laughter, but also a huge uncomfortable aspect of it. Because as I described, I mean, he has been involved, you know, at a certain point, you realize that the implication is that he had one of his neighbors assassinated because of border disputes. There's definitely race stuff, as we've, uh, as you've described in that little piece, that there are terms that now have um, shifted in the, you know, in, in how, how can I say how offensive or antagonistic they are. And English translators, English language translators bringing uh, older works into the now have to struggle with this in, a, you know, in the same way that any of us in classrooms might struggle with um, teaching older works that use terms that now are considered 
I mean, we're already somewhat um, pejorative at the time, but have moved into a more offensive, you know, realm for various reasons. And so uh, to try to balance the um, sort of humor, the sardonic edge of it against the, the aspects of, of Paulo and Ario that are, um, you know, are unlikable, we might say in a more benign way, because there are those aspects of him too. Many people want to argue that his treatment of Madalena makes him a uh, misogynist. Other people want to argue that um, his relationship with her demonstrates really her strength because she resists him all the way through. I mean, these, these are all parts of the, the delicacy of trying to, the delicacy of this like ventriloquist's act, right? How am I going to make him sound in, um, in the English? But as Jeff was talking, I was thinking about the fact that, especially in Jeff's second book of original poems, many of the poems are written in a voice that is not biographical, right? That there are acts of ventriloquism that we might perform in our own works as well. My own last novel, as I mentioned, is narrated by, you know, a man a generation older than me who definitely says things and has problems that aren't really my problems and aren't things that I would say, but I was very interested in entering that um, body and entering his mind in feeling what it would be like to speak that way. And I, I feel like this is a similar sort of process of ventriloquism. At the same time, the, um, you know, the, the wonderful sort of literary spiritual act, I think, of entering into another writer's work to try to make him or her sound the way you hear them in your mind is a sort of a, a humbling in humbling yourself as a writer in front of somebody else's prose. I admire Graciano Hamos so much that I wanted to inhabit not only the character he had created, but in a sense, his process of, of creation to try to recreate my own version of that to bring him and his voice uh, to, um, you know, American audiences. And so that that process, that's different in a sense. I feel like when I'm uh, taking on, you know, trying to create an, an original voice for a character I've created, it's, I think I'd like to believe it's much more egotistical than doing the same with somebody else's work, right? I wanted to try to serve this writer who, you know, I thought should uh, deserve a much bigger audience. And so the calculations then I think are slightly different that way, you know, from when you're creating your own character who's different from you compared to evoking on the page a character that really properly belongs to somebody else, but who, who you're hearing in your head and so trying to ventriloquize that instead. Jeff, do you disagree? You're like, hmm. <laughs> you're muted, you're muted. No, sorry, I, I just noticed a question in the chat bar and so I, 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 I was... <laughs> Distracted by that question, I, but I, I, I was gonna. I, I thought you were gonna also talk a little bit about Ramos's um, use of all these crazy idioms that yeah. I think Lydia was also also sort of interested in uh, with with those selections. Uh, 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 that's that's an interesting thing with this book is all the sort of proliferation of idiom idiomatic phrases sometimes that are really you know funny or strange or inscrutable. Yeah, I mean. Uh, that that's that is a super interesting backstory with this book. Um, let me just find one of I, I, Lydia. You might have had some places to uh, the lines that can y'all hear me right now? We can yes. Hear you. Okay, because my computer is not acting as she should. Mm -hmm. But um, one oh nine was the funny one about the bee in the bonnet. I love that. Um, and another note that I wanted to pull out that, that totally relates to this, um, and please keep telling us about idioms. I could talk about idioms all day. But um, just how how he is just uh, a crabby, I think he's sexist, Lydia's personal opinion, not professional, you know, and racist, and there's all these phrases like crossbreed and this just yuckiness. But I feel like you did this subversive work of, I'm gonna tell it like it is because this is the world that people live in, lived in, and do live in. So I just want to um, highlight how by doing this work, you're um, sort of rebelling against the powers that be, you know, telling the honest truth about class difficulties, about race difficulties of people who are just not lovely. It's all there and it's a part of the human experience. 
Yeah, he's, I mean, Graciano is an interesting person that way too. So he's from the Northeast. He is like 90% of uh, Brazilian authors today, 92% of Brazilian authors are still white. And he was a white man then, but yeah, 92% of Brazilian authors are white, 67% are men um, as of 2012. So um, he is speaking kind of from a majoritarian perspective, but also from the Northeast, which was this um, drought stricken, impoverished area, an area he was really married to in a sense. and. While in the 1930s, there were amazing cultural things going on in the south of Brazil, modernism was a huge movement in Brazil. He was really distant from that. Um, so, you know, it, it is interestingly positioned in those sort of power dynamics that, you know, that, that you're describing. And also in terms of this, um, the aspect of the idiom. So I'm looking at this bit on page nine of the translation. Um, where he says things like, um, right, he's, he's, uh, there's a guy who owes him money. He's been selling and buying and trading, trying to get this capital to buy his, this property he wants to buy. Um, and uh, this is what he does when somebody doesn't pay him back. Senor Sampaio, Sampaio had agreed to buy a herd of cattle from me, but when push came to shove, he gave me the cold shoulder and stood around picking his teeth. I went back and forth around the bend trying to get him to pay up, but he was hard as nails. I cried to him about my miserable luck. I had a bushel of debt. This was no way to deal with people and so on and so forth, et cetera, and so on and so forth, et cetera. This barefaced cheat, a big gun in his town, a mover and shaker told me off. I wasn't discouraged. I, pick out a, I picked out a few fellows from Cancalanco, and when the gentleman headed back to his ranch, I jumped him, tied him up, dragged him into the scrub, tearing his hide on the cactus thorns, prickly pear, mandakaru, shiki shiki, and foxtail. Now let's see who's got clothes in the rucksack. I'll show you how many logs it takes to make a canoe. And so this, like this passage, right, has like 14 idioms or something in it. And for each of those, I had to try to determine whether they were, because um, because it's not the same, right? In the original, a bushel of debt is a big gun in his town. In the uh, the original, is uh, is he's, he's a, a man of a big knife in the original. That would be the literal translation. And so I had to try to figure out what is like a man of a big knife. Is that uh, an idiom that is commonly used? Is an, it an idiom that is commonly used in the Northeast, but not, might not be known to readers in the sort of literary centers of the South? Or is it, as are many of the idioms in here, completely unknown to any literary person? <laughs> and there are a number of, there are so many obscure uh, expressions in this book that there's a whole um, book, like a whole glossary dedicated just to expressions in this novel that I, I found by a couple of Brazilian academics who created a glossary with interpretations of each of those expressions, many of which are not found in any other print source apart from in this book. And so he, Graciliano Ramos, when he was writing this book, he wrote this letter to his wife saying, okay, I've written the book, but I've written it in Portuguese, and now I'm going to translate it into Brazilian. And what that meant for him is that he had been sort of gathering all these expressions from people who worked on his father's farm, from people who'd come into his store that he owned, uh, like his, his dad as well, and he gathered all of these and he started plugging them in. And what I had to do then is I basically have roughly the same proportion of expressions that will be legible to uh, an English speaking audience or will be familiar to an English speaking audience as would have been familiar. And then another class of idioms that are unfamiliar but understandable, like now let's see who's got clothes in the rucksack. I'll show you how many logs it takes to make a canoe. I mean, that is a literal translation. I'll show both of those more or less. Um, I'll show you how many logs it takes to make a canoe. That's not an expression any of us know, but we know exactly what he's saying. And then there's some others where neither us nor any other reader would have a clue what they're talking about because because on a certain level, um, and this was an insight from one of my best friends who's a Brazilian and was my first Portuguese teacher. Um, she, when, when I was asking her about some of these, well, what about this one? What does that mean? And she's like, I have no idea. I don't know. Oh my God, Graciliano is a demon, she said. I mean, she, she loves Graciliano Ramos and she hadn't read this book really closely for a long time. And she's like, he doesn't mean for us to understand that. He is writing this in such a way that 
just like Sam Fowell, just like this, this character wants to enter this class but never will fully enter it, the story is told in such a way that even educated Brazilians will not fully be able to access it. I mean, it's this sort of, you know, demonic calculus that's at the center of this book that I then felt like I had to take into account as I was translating. So, Wow. What a work you chose. Well, you guys, we are out of time. I wish we could talk for two more hours, honestly. Um, people who are watching, audience members, go find these people, Padma Viswanathan, uh, Viswanathan on her website, and Jeffrey Brock, buy these wonderful books. They will just open your heart and mind. Uh, and I really appreciate you guys for being a part of this. I cannot see the chat. Can it, can y'all see the chat? I am frozen right now. Can, is there any more Q's and A's we need to address before we- I just answered one in the chat bar uh, from Aaron. Um, I don't know if there's time for any follow-up questions there or- We are truly out of time. Okay. I um, <laughs> asked way too many questions. But you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you for being a part of the Six Purpose Book Club. Thanks, Lydia. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks.